Let's bring in our panel now. Joining me here in studio is Borzo Dargahi. He's a correspondent with The Independent and a fellow at the Atlantic Council focusing on the Middle East. Ahmed Rushdi is in Baghdad. He's a foreign policy advisor to the Speaker of the Iraqi Parliament. Iranian affairs analyst Said Mustafa Hoshchashim is in Tehran. And in Washington, D.C., we have Jim Phillips. He's a senior research fellow for Middle Eastern Affairs at the Heritage Foundation. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers. Borzu, what we're seeing now with Rouhani and just before him, Zarif, going to Iraq, is this a natural culmination of all the politics and the economics of the past couple of years leading to this? Well, I would say it's even more than just the last couple of years. I mean, Iran and Iraq are neighbors. They're culturally, economically, uh, uh, even sort of kinship-wise entwined uh, with each other. So, you know, this, is, this has been long in the coming. Um, there have been other visits by other Iranian presidents to Baghdad. Other, other uh, Iraqi leaders have visited Tehran. So this is not uh, so unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, the timing of it is interesting, given the pressure that the U.S. is putting on uh, Iran. Uh, over the, uh, the, 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 on the on the sanctions and the, the, the Iranian alleged nefarious activities mm -hmm. in the region and the pressure that they're putting on it. So this is a, a defiant gesture uh, against that pressure. Uh, but it's, you know, in many ways perfectly normal for these countries to have uh, decent ties. Mm -hmm. Jim Phillips, is this the price you pay in Washington for sanctioning Iran? They turn to Iraq? It's a natural reaction uh, of the Iranian regime. It, it needs Iraq more than ever to try to defeat uh, U.S. sanctions. I think uh, President Rouhani is trying to pursue improved state-to-state -state relations. Uh, but what Iraqis, I think, should be concerned about is uh, the Revolutionary Guard aspect of Iran's foreign policy. Uh, and that, I think, sees Iraq as a, a place to meddle, a place to build up militias. Uh, and I think they're pursuing the Hezbollah model to radicalize and split off a militias uh, into groups that they can fully control. Uh, and I think that bodes very ill for Iraq's future if those trends continue. Mustafa Hoshchashim, is that what Iran wants to do in Iraq, to go and meddle and nefariously control the state next door? Of course not. Uh, you know, the visit to Iraq by uh, President Rouhani was a result of uh, actually uh, planning by the whole establishment, uh, but not just for tactical purposes of bypassing the sanctions, but also for some strategic, you know, uh, goals uh, which happen to be very important, not just to Iran, but to Syria, Iraq, and uh, Lebanon. Uh, you know, after uh, the war of militancy failed to topple Iranian allies in Syria and Iraq, and Iran helped to, uh, you know, rescue them, and uh, the situation is uh, rel relatively stable now, uh, Iran believes that uh, it has been pushed by the United States' new uh, you know, uh, offensive in area of economy through the sanctions, not just the sanctions, but also foreign currency meddling by the U.S. and its allies in the region, especially Iran's foreign currency market in Dubai and the UAE, which is believed to be uh, soon transferred to parts of Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, Iran believes that uh, it has been pushed to uh, some warfare in uh, you know, uh, semi-hard uh, areas, that is, economy, and it needs to expand its ties uh, with the East and with the regional states, that includes Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, not just to bypass the sanctions, but to develop uh, their potentials uh, in win-win, uh, you know, uh, games, uh, right. to, uh, to change these countries to powerful uh, economic pull. That's, that's the meaning of uh, we want a powerful region rather than one uh, powerful country in a weak region that has been stated very frequently in the last one or two years by President Rouhani and the establishment. Okay, so let's ask the Iraqi on the panel. Are you comfortable being a part of that club? This is not merely about bilateral economic ties between you and your neighbor. As we're hearing from Mustafa Hoshchashim, this is part of the Iranian plan to strengthen that axis or that belt along with Bashar al-Assad, along with Hezbollah in Lebanon and so on. Are you comfortable being a part of strengthening that other camp in the regional Cold War? Well, I'm very comfortable about solving problems between Iraq and Iran, especially the borders, the water, 
electricity financing and so on. And, and those uh, major problems actually from the 80s, maybe from the 70s. So uh, uh, with, the, with the visit of President Rouhani to Iraq and all those things have been pushed to the table by the Iraqi negotiator in front of the Iranian. And I think the Iranian side accepted to deal with all those issues uh, in spite of postponing some of those uh, problems, which means that a new gate of negotiations between Iraq, Iraq and Iran had been opened due to this visit. Okay. Burzu Daragahi, in the past, a few years ago, there was a tendency to view Iran as a kind of bigger brother to Iraq, especially when Nouri al-Maliki, I guess, was prime minister of Iraq. It's a bit different now. Questions over the Iranian economy for multiple reasons. Who needs whom more? I mean, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I think that it's also important not to look at these two countries as kind of unitary entities. Um, you know, with regard to Iran, for example, you have, you know, Rouhani, uh, you have the foreign minister, Zarif, you have the government, you have, you know, normal business people and normal uh, um, uh, pilgrims going to uh, Iran, uh, Iraq in a very, very transparent way. And then you have this sort of darker element. You have the IRGC, you have the, uh, the SEPA and its clandestine uh, uh, foreign expeditionary force. And they're involved in other stuff. So I think it would help to sort of bifurcate uh, Iran's, you know, you, you had this extraordinary photo today of uh, Hassan Rouhani and Zarif sitting with the Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani, uh, giving them the, the sort of seal of approval that Sistani never gave hmm. to his predecessor, Ahmadinejad. Uh, and this is about Iran's factional uh, uh, sort of fights. And um, uh, wh what you see in Iraq is a welcoming of Rouhani coming, the businessmen coming, the, the overt discussions taking place, and a real suspicion and a real fear about those more clandestine activities. Mustafa Hoshchashim, is that fair? There are two Irans that the Iraqis have to deal with. The one on the surface, as headed by President Rouhani, and then the other one, the he darker he, one. He knows it's no, true, but he can't No, not say at it. all. Not at all. Tell us why. No, I, 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 uh, I can ensure you that this time, um, this is uh, the whole establishment. I mean, President Rouhani even is in Iraq uh, because of the requests made by the whole establishment, not just the IRGC, but also all uh, officials as well as experts, regional experts have been requesting President Rouhani to initiate, you know, the major strategy that I was just talking about. It's just part of a major, uh, you know, strategy that would eventually see strate uh, development of a strategic cooperation with Russia, China, and uh, the regional countries, starting with those that are called the parts of chain of resistance, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And uh, uh, President Rouhani is in there, even uh, not just uh, his cabinet ministers, but also IRGC Quds Force Chief Commander, uh, Major General Qasem Soleimani, was in Iraq uh, to, you know, set the stage and uh, lead a part of the agenda of this trip uh, that President Rouhani is now in Iraq. And, and uh, uh, it, it, the whole establishment, and not just the government, uh, plans to go after, you know, developing relations with these countries. This is not just uh, a move done by the Iranian uh, government, you know. Iran had put all its eggs in the JCPOA, the nuclear deal basket, and uh, it took a long time for President Rouhani to realize that Europeans, as well as the United States, would not eventually come back to invest in Iran and to normalize ties uh, with Iran. So he has been convinced there are very clear indications in Tehran and in the last few weeks to notice that uh, 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 eventually President Rouhani uh, has picked up uh, the new strategy of developing economic ties with these four countries as well as uh, Russia and China. Now, from now on, uh, you could see a, completely ch a complete change, a fundamental change in Rouhani's approach towards the regional countries. And Borzu, you want to respond to that? Well, I mean, you, you know, absolutely. I think that everyone in the Iranian establishment is be in favor of having better ties uh, with Iraq, uh, having good ties with Iran. And that uh, crosses many factions. Um, but what I would say from the Iraqi point of view, and I've traveled to Iraq very, very many times over the last 
uh, 17 years. I was just in Soleimani and Erbil uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, uh, both cities, uh, and so on. And I met with uh, Dr. Barham Saleh and other officials uh, of the Iraqi government, other Iraqi experts, and so on. And you know what? There is a real fear hmm. of what the Iranian motive is, and I think there's a real nervousness about this talk of. Uh, bringing Iraq into this axis. Okay. As a matter of fact, Dr. Barham Saleh, the president himself, was saying, please, please don't bring your regional battles hmm. to Iraq. Please don't, because we're still fragile here. We still have not recovered fully from the ISIS war. And if you bring your fight here, you will break us. So, Ahmed Rushdi, do you fear, forget the Iranians for a second, do you fear American punishment? That the Americans might get a little moody now that you're getting closer to the Iranians, and that might become a bit more unstable, your relationship with the Americans. Well, I don't think so, because the American knows very well is that we are neighbors, and we will stay neighbors for, for a long, long time. And uh, at the end, Iraq uh, has a trade exchange for about $8 billion with, uh, with the Iranian. In a way or another, uh, maybe Iraq and now making, uh, putting the $8 billion on the table in front of the Iranian with solving problems with the Iranian side. At the same time, just maybe, Iraq will take some sort of measurements to talk to the Americans to get exceptions for the embargo or the economical sanctions against, the, against Iran. Because just as I said, Iran and Iraq are still neighbors. There are some sort of economical interests between each other, just right. like between Iraq and Turkey and so on. Yeah, Turkey also has some of those exemptions when it comes to the Iran's, uh, the, the, the Iran sanctions, rather. Uh, Turkey's Foreign Minister Çavuşoğlu is still saying that he believes that the sanctions are a bad idea. Jim Phillips, do you accept that Iran and Iraq are natural allies and this is just the way it will be? Because they're in the region, they're next door. I think if they uh, kept to purely national interests, uh, that... There would be room for compromise. Uh, unfortunately, as you were mentioning, uh, the struggle between uh, the t at least two sides in Iran, in which the logic of the revolution uh, undermines the logic of the state. And most recently, we saw that in action when uh, President Assad went to uh, Iran, and in the picture was General Soleimani, who has much more control over Iranian foreign policy in Syria and Iraq than uh, the foreign ministry does. And I think that's one reason why the foreign minister Zarif resigned. And this tension between the logic of the state and the logic of the revolution has been present since the beginning. We saw that uh, in the debates over the release of U.S. hostages and on uh, continued factional politics since then. And I think although uh, Iran state leaders want good state-to-state -state relations, uh, the real thing to watch is what General Soleimani is doing to undermine Iraqi sovereignty and, uh, and expand Iran's revolutionary interests. Mm -hmm. and, and I think also it should be borne in mind that it's the Revolutionary Guards that control uh, Iran's ballistic missiles and uh, its nuclear program, which triggered the sanctions, which I would argue uh, are, are not in Iran's national interest. Uh, and in that respect, the logic of the revolution has really hurt uh, ir everyday Iranians. So as we sit in 2019, Jim, if everything that you, you've said is true or everything that you fear is as true as it seems to you about the influence of the Revolutionary Guards Corps, Qasem Soleimani, and the other faction in Iran, with all the American lives lost and all the billions spent in Iraq, does it feel like a waste of time that the country is now pivoting towards the Iranians? Well, I uh, never subscribed uh, to the Bush administration's uh, argument that Iraq would emerge as a democracy from the post-war. I think that ignored huge cultural differences. Uh, and it's, you know, it's natural for uh, Iraqis who live for many years under Saddam Hussein and suffered under him, I think it's natural that they resent it, the fact that it was the U.S. that defeated Saddam Hussein and not their own uh, uh, actions or Iran's actions. So uh, I think it's, it's, there's room for good Iraqi-Iranian state-to-state relations, but 
I think uh, Iraqis, as well as the U.S., and as well as all Iranians, have an interest in undermining the power of those in Iran who seek to export the revolution and terrorism. Mustafa Hoshchesham, does Iran want to export the revolution and terrorism to Iraq? Never. Uh, you know, when Iraq came uh, under attack by Daesh and the militants, Iran was the first to rush to their aid. Uh, uh, according to Masoud Barzani, Iran was the first to send them weapons and advisors in Iraqi Kurdistan region. Iran played a major role in combating ISIL and defeating it, uh, at least in the defense phase. Uh, the security phase has just started. But now we are not talking about a military warfare anymore. We're speaking of uh, economic, you know, a, a, an economic area. Iran believes that if the Sunni population in Western Iraq uh, has, you know, they have enough jobs and that they, they enjoy welfare, then they would be very much sensitive to the presence of foreign troops that are seen as potential threat to their uh, welfare, stability, and security. That means a guarantee that they would not allow the United States or any foreign uh, troops to threaten Tehran, as uh, Mr. Trump said. But one more thing is that it's interesting to me how double standard views are there in Washington and elsewhere. When there are differences between the Congress and President Trump, they call it pluralism as part of democracy, as an indication of live democracy in the U.S. But when there are different views, naturally, in Tehran, they call it rifts, fundamental differences between branches of power in okay. Iran. I don't know why they okay. are looking at the, the same okay, so issue let me, let so me differently, get to address that. but okay. I, 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 okay. I rest assured that Iran's policy is, is the product of one single strategy now in the okay. whole region. Okay, so... So when oh, the, so, so okay so when, so it's when just the, like when the Trump Democrats, versus a democratic Congress. No, it, when the Democrats and the Republicans are in a fight, that's a you know political fight. When the reformists and the conservatives are in a in a fight, that's a legitimate political fight. When you have a kind of a secret war between let's say Trump and elements of the security forces, elements of the CIA and the FBI who are you know kind of at war with each other, that's something else. And when you have a, a kind of years-long rift between the elected government and in, in Iran and, you know, dark elements within the security forces, Are the dark Minister elements, of in your opinion, more powerful than the elected elements? Uh, in certain respects, they're more powerful in Iran. Uh, in, in certain respects, they're not. Uh, the, the, the elected elements have legitimacy. They have, you know, popular legitimacy. They have uh, uh, thousands, millions of people behind them. But the, you know, darker elements, the... MOIS, the uh, SEPA, the Revolutionary Guard, the, the Basiji forces, these people have the control over the weapons and the guns, and they are very well organized. Okay, as we circle this back to the beginning and we take the focus slightly off Iran for the moment and refocus on the Iraqis again, let me ask Ahmed Rushdie, what does this move, these meetings, what does this say about Iraqi regional policy moving forward? What's the message to the world about where Iraq is right now? Well, let us not forget that the three uh, characters, the three persons who are leading Iraq now, Dr. Barham Saleh, Dr. Adil Abdel Mahdi, Mr. Halbousi, is actually, they are actually looking uh, forward for a strong strategic relationship with the United States and also a strong fundamental neighborhood relationship with Iran. Because at the end, Iraq as a state has so many problems. The, the first one, or let, let, let's say the first priority is anti-terrorism or let's say fighting terrorism and the second one economy because you know Iraq has so many problems especially uh, in its economy so uh, on those bases I think the three persons the, the three leaders working hard to maintain those two uh, legitimate uh, relationship now on the other hand the parliament and also the government and even uh, uh, the, the the political blocs looking forward to have some sort of a balance in this relationship. At the end, Iraq, uh, Iraqis is looking for Iraq as, as, a, as a, a, a sovereignty uh, country and also as independent country. So, Jim, is the problem with the Trump administration that it's trying to make the Iraqis choose? The Iraqis want to balance it, but the Trump administration is telling Barham Saleh and tell, telling Adil Abdel Mahdi, no, you've got to choose. It's either us or the Iranians. 
I think in, uh, in the, the big picture, I think that's the general theory behind uh, sanctions, choosing between trade with Iran's market or trade uh, with the much bigger uh, American market. And the, that strategy may not fully work in Iraq, because I think Iraq does have a lot to gain from trade uh, with Iran. Uh, but not as much as Iran has to get, uh, gain with trade with Iraq at this point because of U.S. sanctions. And I would just uh, say that, uh, you know, Iraqis have a stake in the outcome of the political struggle in uh, Tehran also. And I'm not talking about the political struggle between members in, in the majlis or, uh, you know, peaceful struggles. but. You know, the Revolutionary Guards and other uh, forces have assassinated scores of Iranians overseas. And in Europe, they were recently caught red-handed. And uh, th that kind of thing has been uh, known to happen in Iraq also. So I would say Iraqis have an interest in uh, modifying the future policy of the Iran government and leading it away from uh, revolutionary activity and towards better state-to-state -state relations. And I think that's what Washington wants, is if Iran acts as a normal country and not as the vanguard of a global Islamic revolution, which is what some people in Tehran uh, still see its role as being. Okay. And Mustafa Hoshashim, the man makes a good point, right? The Re Revolutionary Guard's not known for handing out cakes and candy. They do some fairly brutal stuff as well, right? You know, uh, it's not good to use the Iraqi or to try to use uh, the Iraqi people and the uh, government for advancement of the United States uh, interventionist policies in Iran. Uh, uh, when it comes to influence, it's not bad to compare uh, the way that Donald Trump uh, traveled to Iraq with his you know, uh, planes that had its lights off for a couple of hours without the information of anyone, without any meeting with officials. And for a couple of hours at a military base in southwestern Iraq, he was there and he escaped. While he was voicing, he was not shy of voicing his concerns about uh, his life and the life of the First Lady. And compare it with uh, President Rouhani's three-day-long visit with so many achievements that are uh, uh, in perspective already, and uh, 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 Iranian foreign minister and other Iranian cabinet ministers with, were in Iraq for conducting preparations as well as the IRGC. When it comes to IRGC, it's not bad to show some respect because the same ISIL or Daesh members that were killing people in Madrid, in uh, London, in all across Europe uh, in suicide attacks, they were killed and they were annihilated in Syria and Iraq, mainly by Iran, Russia and Syria and Iraq, of course, and uh, the, the mobilized forces of these two countries. So at least I believe that Europeans and many others across the world are indebted to the IRGC and its anti-terrorism campaign. Uh, running smear campaign against the IRGC means support for the ISIL. We've seen uh, U.S. troops in the region for more than, for around two decades now. What has been the result except for the rise of various terrorist groups? And okay. as soon as Iran and Russia and their, you know, allies, uh, uh, they rushed to the scene, okay. they, okay. you Although, know, annihilated certainly, these terrorist certainly. groups. Okay. Okay, so Mr. I believe they, okay. uh, they, they are, uh, uh, I mean, they, they, they deserve respect. I think it can be argued that the IRGC didn't pound Daesh for the sake of keeping European capital safe. There were far more local issues to deal with on the ground. However, point taken, let me ask Burzu. Should the West be grateful to the IRGC that they helped destroy Daesh? I mean, I, I, I don't even know what that would mean. Um, you know, I, I would think that the IRGC, uh, like other forces uh, in trying to uh, defend the Iranian uh, country, uh, did mobilize uh, in, uh, in Iraq, uh, did uh, support the creation of the popular mobilization, but that's created uh, its own problems. Mm -hmm. Those militias have now become a Frankenstein that are uh, creating their own problems. So I don't know how anyone could be thankful of that. Okay, listen, gentlemen, I've got to wrap, but it's been really good getting the four different perspectives on the program. Burzu Daragahi, Ahmed Rushdi, Said Mustafa Hoshchashim, and Jim Phillips, thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers.